production strategies. Welcome to everybody. Um, this is the organic commercial fruit production strategies for the Midwest webinar series. Today, we're going to be talking about organic insect management. My name is Madeline Wimmer, and I am with the University of Minnesota Extension. I'm a statewide educator working with fruit production, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Today, we're joined with two wonderful speakers, Christelle Goudeau and Casey Athey, to talk about organic insect management. So Dr. Athey is the specialty crops extension entomologist at the University of Illinois. Her research focuses on non-chemical control of insect pests in vegetables and fruit. Her current projects are exploring biological control in high tunnels and cultural control in tomato and cucumber production. In addition to her research, and extension duties, she team teaches two classes in the Crop Sciences Department at the University of Illinois. And we'll be joined by Christelle Goudeau, who is an associate professor in the Department of Entomology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her research and extension programs focus on agroecological approaches to pest and pollinator management with the goal to develop more sustainable management strategies for key insect pests that will reduce the reliance on pesticides to promote beneficial insects, environmental quality, and farmers' livelihood. So those are going to be our two speakers for today discussing organic insect management and just some housekeeping, housekeeping before we begin. A reminder to mute yourself and turn off your video and to plug in any questions you might have for our speakers today into the chat box. If you would like to ask your questions um, verbally at the end when we're in our Q&A session, you're welcome to, to do that and we'll unmute you and you can ask your question at that time. So we'll start off with our talks and then we'll present a small short poll for you all to take and then we'll go into our question and answer session. So with that, I would like to pass the mic to Christelle and Casey. Thank you, Madeline, for this wonderful introduction. Um, and I will share my screen. And let me know if that's good to go. Is that working? Looks good. OK, thank you. Well, thanks, everyone. Oops already going without me. Okay, so we're going to talk today um, about organic insect pest management. And again, I'm Christelle Guedo, and my colleague Casey and I will flip-flop during the talk to talk to you about a lot of different topics. So we have a lot to cover today. So, of course. Okay. All right. So we're gonna start by talking to you about integrated pest management, because whether you're organic or conventional, what we're trying to go for is really this integrated approach that's going to allow you to manage your insects in a very sustainable, science-based, and decision-making process. So I'm reading the definition that's here. That combines biological, cultural, physical, or behavioral, and chemical tools to identify, manage, and reduce risks from pests with pest management tools and strategies in a way that minimizes overall economic health and environmental risks. It's important that all these parts of this integrated pest management definition are very important in understanding the whole process. So it's really this integration of strategies using specific tools for each of those strategies. And we think a lot about it with this IPM pyramid here that you can see. This is mainly the IPM pyramid in general, and what we, um, we look for is at the bottom, at the base of this pyramid is avoiding the potential problems um, by uh, doing these different strategies. I'll talk about that, we'll talk about that, so don't worry about it. Then we are doing surveillance to make sure that we know when those insect pests will be problematic. And then at the very end of this is when we would implement chemical control. So it's very important to think about it in this strategy, especially when we're talking about organic. And I'll get back to this, so don't worry. And when we're looking, another way of looking at this IPM, this integrated pest management, is seeing all of these different strategies are as ways of uh, looking at, at integrated pest management with bioeconomics that you find up at the top here, 
and those thresholds, so the economic enterprise that you're doing when you're growing a crop, being very important in, in providing this feedback loop on how you implement those strategies, when you implement them, to make sure you make a profit. And all of that is really targeted in lowering our environmental impact and making sure that everything that's in the environment, whether it's the people, it's the plants, it's the other you know, animals that are around, all of that is kind of taken into account uh, in, in inter integrated pest management. So it's kind of this agroecological approach um, of the whole system. And when we're talking specifically about IPM production in uh, IPM in organic production, it's very important to think about it in this pyramid where prevention is the basis of everything. And it's going to be your cultural control methods that include sanitation and a lot of different ones. And enhancing the crop health. All of that is really the basis to make sure that you, you prevent having a very bad outbreak of pest populations. You then build on that by uh, providing inputs, and that will be your uh, control methods biological control, behavioral control, cultural control methods. These are gonna become inputs that you are gonna, you're gonna do there. Some of them, we'll talk about that, are also a little bit in prevention. And then the final one, really the last resort, ends up being your um, chemical control. And, uh, and that's what we'll talk about at the end because really it should be at the very end of this pyramid that you think about those chemical controls. And when we think about those chemical controls, so I have the, the traditional IPM pyramid, there's a, something that's very important, and Casey will talk to you again about that, but it's really understanding when do we apply those chemical control. You don't want to be applying this without having a good understanding about integrated pest management, but also the economic enterprise you're on. And so what we define this as what is the economic injury level? And then what is the economic threshold? And you'll hear about that or action thresholds. These are important terms that people will use to say, okay, now I've reached this threshold, I should be applying a chemical control. And these two aspects are represented here. And really what this shows you is that on the y-axis, you have the number of insects, on the x-axis is time, and when insect population, so it's your numbers, reach this line, which is the economic threshold, you need to spray an insecticide. So you do not reach what's called the economic injury level is when you start losing money. And so we want you to know about these action thresholds or economic thresholds because they're very important and are the trigger for chemical control. So what are your IPM steps? Um, and there's a lot of them. So we're going to go over all of that. So that's going to be a lot. But you want to be monitoring and understanding your insects, identifying them, making sure that you know when they're present and when they're susceptible. You want to use those economic threshold or action thresholds that we talked about if you need to apply an insecticide. But before you get there, you want to be looking at those control measures and what's available to you in your system and we're gonna introduce to you to a lot of those, but not all of them. But the strategies, we're gonna introduce you to all of those. Host plant resistance is one we'll talk briefly about, biological control, cultural control, behavioral control, chemical control. And then you always wanna make sure that you assess the effectiveness of your control strategies. And that's very important for you to monitor the population. So you go back into the monitoring that's at the beginning because this is how you're going to know if your, your strategies are working in reducing your pest populations. We're going to have different types of insects. And we're not talking here specifically about apple or raspberries or um, you know uh, grapes. We're talking in general. So examples will come from all over. But what's really important to think about is you have different types of insects. You have what we call direct insect pests. They will feed directly on the fruit that you are trying to grow and sell or eat. Then there's indirect pests that will feed on any other part of the plant. It could be the leaves, the roots, the, the stems, but they will still affect your, your, um, your bottom line, your food production. 
they're important to pay attention to. And then there's the pests that are going to be key pests. And these are going to be the insects that you're going to see no matter what you do. They're going to be there. In apple, for example, cuddling moth, you're not going to have an orchard without cuddling moth. That's not going to happen. Now, if you're talking about raspberries, you're probably not going to have anything without spotted wing glossophila. So that's a key pest. Every year, in pretty much every orchard around you and in the state or something at a regional level, potentially, you'll have to deal with. And then there's what we call secondary pests. And those might be on your farm, but on your neighbors, or they might be one year and not the other. And we don't know. They are a little bit unpredictable, but they can still cause tremendous damage and have outbreaks. So you still need to pay attention to them. So for each of those insect pests that you're going to learn about as you're growing this crop and you're starting this uh, strategy, this uh, culture, you're going to want to look at knowing how to identify your insect species. Know them. You need to know those species. You need to know their life cycle and their seasonal phenology. And that relates to when they're present in your, in your um, farm. You want to monitor to estimate when they're active in your at your farm. You want to estimate when uh, the vulnerable stages are present on your farm, because sometimes we'll tell you, oh, well, here, th there's no point in managing, say, the adults. What you need to manage is the larvae, is the immatures, and it can flip flops depending on the species. Determine if you have reached that economic threshold. Is the number that you're seeing high enough that it is worth your money and time to apply this management strategy or are they in such low numbers that doesn't matter. So you need to keep a logbook so you can track all those life stages, where they are in your, in your orchard, how many do you have, et cetera. You wanna record weather data and you wanna have pest management guides. There are a lot out there. So you wanna equip yourself with as much as you can to know what to do with those. So knowing your pest is important, identifying them. Do I have culling moth or is this an apple maggot or is this a spotted wing drosophila? And you'll learn about them. That There's no question. And then you'll learn about their life cycle. And their life cycle can be very important or is very important because depending on where they are, for example, here, you will have the larvae in the fruit, but then they go into the trunk. That's like culling moth into the trunk and they might pupate there. So maybe there's ways of intercepting that. Or it can be spotted wing drosophila and intercepting them as they're falling to the ground to go pupate might be a good strategy. Or killing the adults so they don't lay it. So all of that is very important. And then um, um, it's, a, it's a big picture. So it's important to think about all of that. It will help you um, also protect um, the environment as you are being more careful and more targeted in your strategies. Um, another important part, there's the life cycle itself. But for example, for cuddling moth in this, um, this graph here, you will have this life cycle that we talk about from egg to adult repeat itself two to three times. This would be one generation, two generation here, and sometimes a third generation up here in the, in the upper Midwest. So this is putting the life cycle into the seasonal phenology of those um, when those insects are present for one species. And you can see you have the calendar dates here, or the months, but down here you have what's called degree days. And the reason why we talk about degree days is because insects are cold-blooded. And when they're, because they're cold-blooded, temp the temperature has a very strong effect on their development. And so using calendar dates is not always the best way of looking at this. If you have a very warm spring, well, they might show up earlier than what you would, you would expect in late May. They might be early May. So all of that is really important. And we call that the measure of the, the amount of heat they experience degree days. And we're not going to go further into that, but there are models that can help you predict with those degree days. And then I'll pass it on to Casey. All right. Uh, thank you, Christelle. Yeah. So. Once you kind of have an idea about what pests are around, you need to sample for them. So one of the tenets of IPM is actually knowing what pests are in your area. And we do this in just a variety of ways. And what I've listed here is 
common sampling types, but you'll notice I've got two that are kind of grayed out. Um, so I'm not going to talk about those today. Uh, those might be less um, applicable for your actual operation. And so I'm going to go ahead and start here with <clears throat> the first type of sort of scouting and monitoring, which is just direct counts or using observations. So going out in your field and actually looking for insects. Now, we generally do this in a systematic way. Um, and if you have a very small plant, it's really early in the season, we often recommend that you go out and you can actually look at the whole plant and see if there's um, insects on there already. So like if you're looking for aphids, for example, um, and uh, or scales, things that are kind of slow moving, um, you can do these direct counts and observations uh, and you'll you'll learn about thresholds that say how many of these should be on that plant in order to then um, use control. Obviously, if you have trees, shrubs, much larger plants, as it goes on, we recommend that as you're doing these observations, you're maybe picking three leaves on the plant or you're picking two um, branches and you're counting the pests on that as your economic threshold. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about all the different ways that we do this, but there are, it's very pest specific, but just know that scouting often is just walking out in the field and actually looking at the plants to see what's out there. And then this is particularly important in conventional and organic um, uh, production. What probably get, happens more is using trapping. So actually using something that is, again, specific to the pest that you're looking for. And um, the sort of first one I want to talk about here is this passive trapping. And what I mean by this is that the bugs just accidentally encounter the trap. And of we have a lot of trapping types that do this that we use in research, but for production, we'd be dealing with these clear panel sticky traps where essentially you're just seeing you know, what's out there. This is a very passive way of trapping. Um, I don't mean passive in that you don't have to do anything because of course you have to go out and look at your traps, but I mean passive in that it's not attracting the insects in any way, they're just hitting it. Active monitoring, active trapping is actually much more common. Um, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So active traps are much more common. This is what you're actually going to be using um, in your production, in your fields. Um, and there's a bunch of different ways of doing this. And again, what I mean by active is that the insects have to seek it out. It has some sort of thing that draws the insects into it your pests. And so what I have here is a variety of um, trapping types that um, will that are used in organic production. Um, the first one being a, a visual trap. And so light traps are the most common of those. And actually, the light trap is the one that's third from the right here. Um, and those can be used for uh, a lot of different, um, they are used for mosquitoes, but in production, they're used for um, uh, moths. So there are certain moth pests that uh, are attracted to the to light, and there will be thresholds that will be based on, again, how many of those moths do you count per day or per week in that trap. In addition, we have things like bait traps. Um, so uh, the picture here, the second from the left, is the um, uh, spotted wing drosophila trap. And so spotted wing drosophila are attracted to, we put vinegar and yeast in those sorts of traps, and then that's a monitoring trap to see, again, how many you're getting over some period of time. Um, the trap on the very left is a bucket trap, and we use those to monitor for a variety of moth pests, um, things like uh, um, squash vine borer, very common for that. And then... Um, on the very right, we have uh, delta traps there, um, and those use pheromones, generally speaking. And delta traps are really common in our tree fruit production, and uh, we have pheromones uh, available for um, a variety of pests. And I'm going to go on to pheromones in the next slide, but I do want to mention there are also other sticky traps out there that are used that have color, and so they're more active because the bugs are actually attracted to those. Um, next slide. All right. 
So pheromones. Um, so pheromones are just uh, chemicals that are released by one insect to be able to talk to members of its same species. Um, <clears throat> and we use these in a variety of traps. And they're really pretty inexpensive and they're really effective because they only attract the one pest you actually want. And so when you use a pheromone trap, often the only thing you're finding in there is the pest of interest. So it's much easier for you to identify those things. Um, and they are used extensively in insect sampling um, programs. Again, we've listed things like codling moth, corn earworm, uh, gypsy moth, these sorts of things um, uh, pheromones are used um, extensively with. And we often will use what is in the pheromone trap, again, is sort of our economic threshold. How many we're getting in there then determines um, uh, you know, when you might want to spray or take some control uh, measure. Okay, next slide. And then this, these are just two of the most common um, uh, pheromone uh, trapping, um, pheromone traps that you'll see. So on the, on the left there is um, for things like corn earworm, um, and then on the right is uh, one that would be used for codling moth and other tree pests. So again, these are really, really common. I think uh, currently there's about 155 different pheromone products that are labeled um, that are commercially available. So you can see you can use these for just a variety of pest issues. All right, next slide. So the next thing that I want to talk about is uh, biological control. So biological control is um, something that is used pretty extensively in organic production. We do actually use it in conventional as well, um, but I would say it's definitely more of a common um, common thing in organic production. And I just want to say like what biocontrol actually is. Um, and it is the uh, suppression or prevention of a pest outbreak due to the purposeful manipulation of natural enemies. So you have to actually do something for it to be considered biological control. So this is distinct from just like natural control, just watching say a spider eat a bug in your cropping system. Um, and I want to point out that, you know, na uh, natural enemies can be predators, um, parasitoids, or pathogens. So I have pictures on here on the very left. I have some pictures of some parasitoid wasps. Um, so the very left picture is uh, parasitoid larvae actually emerging from a hornworm caterpillar. And then the one right next to it is the adult that will eventually come out of those. And then I have um, a lady beetle uh, there in the middle. That's a predator. Um, a really common aphid predator that you find across most systems. And then there next to that is a pathogen of this weevil that has killed the weevil, a fungal pathogen. And then I have another predator there on the right, a really common biological control agent, Aureus insidiosus, one that is um, commercially available that you can, you can purchase. Um, and uh, the, the next set here is there's three different types of biological control that are um, uh, that we talk about. Um, and I'm gonna go through through these here in the next couple of slides. Uh, so the first one is importation biological control. And this is for invasive species. Now, this isn't something that you would actually be doing um, uh, on your in your cropping system, but it might be something that's happening. So uh, this is where if an invasive species comes in, we might go as researchers to their native range and look for things in the native range that are controlling it there. Then we bring them back, do a variety of things to figure out that it's really only going after this pest. And then we would bring it and introduce it to the environment. And the example I have here is um, spotted wing drosophila, which again is a huge problem in a variety of cropping systems. There is a parasitoid wasp that has been approved for release and has been released um, across different landscapes for the to control this pest. And so this might be something on your farm that is being released over the top of the other things that you're doing. So it's something you have to take into account. Next slide. Um, the most common type of biological control in IPM is augmentative biological control. And this is where you actually purchase bugs from a commercial supplier and you release them into your fields. And this is good for regular predictable pests. It has very good efficacy in protected culture, works really well in greenhouses and high tunnels. So it's great in um, vegetable production. Um, 
And it's I, I liken this to instead of it being an insecticide spray that's a chemical, it's like we're spraying bugs instead. Okay, next slide. Um, and this is a bunch of information for you. And what I'm trying to illustrate here is that unlike an insecticide spray, there's a lot of questions that you have to ask if you're going to do this when you call the companies. University of Kentucky, um, I have that link there, has a really good list of all the different vendors. It's a couple years old now, but a couple all the vendors in North America that sell these agents. And you want to ask the vendors lots of questions. If you're going to use this as a control measure, you want to call the company and there's a variety of things you want to ask before you start using this to make sure that you're using these bugs properly and they're not just going to die when they get to you. Next slide. Um, and I just wanted to show you this, just to show you that um, the uh, there's a bunch of different ways that these bugs will come to you. Um, so uh, they might come up in the upper left. These are eggs on a card, so they're going to hatch and walk out on the plant. Uh, the lower left is just basically a bottle of agents that you just sprinkle on your plants. And then in the middle are sachets that you hang, as you can see in the right photo, on a plant. And then the bugs will come out of there and eat your pests. All right, next slide. And then I just want to talk briefly about conservation biological control. So if you don't want to buy natural enemies, you can do things to your environment to really bring in more of the natural enemies that are already there. And that's, what's con that's what con conservation biological control is. This requires, again, an active manipulation of the landscape and things like altering your use of pesticides, using strip cropping, using weed strips, and really, ultimately, it's using plantings that provide food for predators, things that will give them extra nectar, sugar, and pollen, with the idea of attracting and retraining predators to your system before the pests even get there, so they're ready to eat when the pests arrive in your fields. Okay, next slide. Thanks, Casey. So we're going to switch gear to another type of strategy, which is called cultural control. And really, in this case, cultural control for organic production is really going to be one of the foundational strategy that you're going to want to use. And there's not one strategy under cultural control. There's different strategies that you can use. It's really an ecological manipulation of the crop environment. It's a very old way of doing things. It's really looking at what you see and making smart observations and, and trying to implement things to prevent insects from becoming pests in the first place. So that's what we're going to talk about. And I'm going to have a lot of different um, strategies you can use to implement uh, cultural control. The first set is going to be how do you reduce the environmental favorability of the crop? How do you make it that it's just the environment is not conducive for this insect to come in the first place? So an important one for a lot of different things, and I had it in the IPM pyramid, is sanitation. And sanitation is very important because you're removing crop residue. And we're talking really about these dropped apples that you have, these dropped raspberries in this picture, or strawberries, or those that are damaged on your crop. Removing those is a very important strategy because it, it prevents other insects and this to come in and this insect to continue to develop into those, those crop residues. If you think about it, um, composting uh, damaged fruit or infested fruit is not a good idea. What you want to do is get rid of them and remove them from your system. You want to maybe solarize them or do something with this crop residue because there are larvae in this fruit and they're going to be continuing to develop and emerge and go infest your fresh fruit. So it's important to remove crop residue and there's Different ways you can do that depending on the cropping system you're using. Some people feed them to chickens, for example. Um, another way is by obscuring the host presence. So in this, um, this case, what you're trying to do is make it that the insect has a hard time locating the, the, their host, like where they're going to lay their eggs. So for example, or feed on, on those plants. For example, here, it's an example for thrips. We have the same example with spot green for zoffila and raspberries. You put the, this kind of uh, reflective material and it makes the insect be very confused because it's reflecting the sun and they are not able to find the same way the, uh, the plant that they're trying to um, go infest. So that's something that can be done um, to obscure the host presence. 
can also be done with things that are olfactory by, for example, putting a repellent plant that would be next to that. And then you can smell the attractive plant, the fruit that you're trying to go feed on. So you're obscuring the host presence. Mowing is a strategy that in, in, for some insects, insects work really well. Not all of them, of course, but um, for some of them, it works well. So one good example is, for example, um, um, Japanese beetle in, um, in the turf. So say you're in a vineyard, in the turf that you have between rows of a vineyard, mowing the lawn there can uh, make it really short, no, uh, less short than you would. So more than three inches, sorry. You would prevent a little bit of the female going in there and trying to dig in the soil to go lay eggs. So mowing can have an impact on some of those insects. Irrigation and water management is another strategy. And for some insects, having a drip irrigation, like you can see in the, on the right-hand side here, makes it that the canopy of your plant is less humid. And by being less humid, if it's an insect like spot ring drosophila that likes really high humidity, it will dry up the plants and reduce the infestation levels. Not to a max, to complete extent, but here we're trying to slowly reduce the populations with different strategies that are gonna make that population lower, hopefully, than the economic threshold. Um, as a, and I'm talking about drip irrigation as opposed to say sprinkler irrigation, which gun, is gonna make this a very um, wet environment. But for some other insects, this might be what you need to do because they like dry conditions, say mites, for example, or thrips. So I'm not saying you should do sprinkler irrigation for that, but that's something to think about and to alter depending on what is your main problem that you have in your cropping system. Tilling, uh, while this is, something that is less and less recommended from a soil health standpoint and all the microorganisms that are in the soil, it has been shown to help reduce um, population of different insects. When you think about it, it's something like 90% of insects that will spend some part of their life cycle in the ground, whether it's the larvae, the pupae, um, it, it just varies on what it is. And if you're tilling the soil where they are, even the, the top surface of the soil, you might be dis disrupting this um, oviposition or this egg laying, this um, overwintering or pupation. And so that will disturb some insects. And you have an example here for Japanese beetle where when it's tilled, you have lower numbers than when it's a grassy area. And you can see it on those different graphs. The, the tilled is always lower than the grassy area in the alleyways. Mulching is also something that you can do. Um, this is just some uh, very uh, preliminary data from a student that was in, uh, in our department before. And it's looking at putting mulch over the alleyways for Japanese beetle in this case. And what you have here is um, bark mulch or hardwood chips or even rubber mulch that was significantly reducing the number of Japanese beetle larvae in those alleyways in the grass compared to just a regular grass. So something to also think about, it can help in preventing egg laying, but it can also prevent pupation, and it can also prevent emergence of your insects because there is a layer there that prevents them from emerging. And we've shown that for spotted wing drosophila as well. So something to think about. Um, another thing you can do is reduce the continuity in space. Um, and that would be through crop spacing. So that's an example with soybean, but um, where you separate the plants so the canopy doesn't close in, or you have the canopy close in, depending on what it is you're trying to do. Uh, sometimes it's better to separate so there's no contact between plants. But there's also pruning that's important. If you're pruning your plants, you have more airflow, you're opening up the canopy, you have an environment that's less humid, and sometimes also, for example, in sputtering drosophila can reduce uh, populations because you have an, an environment that gets a lot of sunlight and spotted wing likes dark uh, environments. Crop location um, is also something that's important. And that's something that I would say is really important when you're establishing a, a farm. When you're planting your first, say, strawberry patch or your raspberries or your grapes, Thinking in this example, an apple orchard, 
thinking about where you are putting your, your crop is important. And so if you have what we would call alternate hosts, for example, you would want to be away from alternate hosts that can provide an area and a habitat for your insects. If you're trying to manage them there, they might all go to another place. Um, but there's also some that overwinter outside of the orchard. So for example, here it's from Cocolio, they overwinter outside. And so um, they will come back in from the woodlots that are around. So being away from woodlots, for example, could help. Um, or having uh, no plum nearby for plum cocolio. I have here a ligus, bus be ligus bug because they love alfalfa. And so if you have alfalfa next to your strawberry, as soon as the alfalfa gets cut, then they move from the alfalfa to the strawberry. So thinking about that, is there an alfalfa field next to you? These are important when you're thinking about, about planting. Disrupting the chronological continuity um, is an important thing. Um, in this example, there's multiple crop rotation is one you can think about, but that works better in annual crops. But in this case, it's crop following. And that's been a strategy used for, for ages uh, where people will put aside a field because they have either a lot of pathogens, for example, or they have um, a, a high population of an insect species. And so the example here is strawberry rootworm. Um, really the strategy with our, our, our June bearing strawberries here is if you have a high population, just rotate out of your strawberry and then leave it aside, plant something else, a dissimilar crop, and then come back in a couple of years and you will have uh, reduced that population almost to zero. Um, so that's something to think about, this crop following or crop rotation, things like that. A crop rotation, think about it for the soybean and corn. That is based on insects um, in, in those systems. You rotate it out so that you can get rid of those pest populations. Another strategy for disrupting the continuity of resources is the synchrony and thinking about it in time as opposed in space. So here, what you're trying to do is plant a crop that will avoid the peak population in that seasonal phenology we were talking about. So I have here, this is data from my lab, the, the, uh, the time, and you can see the population of uh, spotted wing drosophila. Well, if you have uh, raspberries, we tend to have fall bearing raspberries, which are gonna be down here. You can't really see the dates, but that will be the fall here, September or so. Um, and August. But if you plant summer bearing raspberries, you're going to be in the spring or like late spring, early summer, and we don't see a lot of spotted wing off at this time. So you're trying to, to think about how to avoid the plant and the insect to be at the same time at the worst time when they're going to peak. Trap cropping is another strategy. And in this case, what you're trying to do is divert the pest away from the crops. So you remember Ligus bug that I mentioned, they love alfalfa, but they also love strawberry. And research in my lab just showed that if you are planting a row of alfalfa next to your strawberry crop, they will go into the alfalfa and you'll have less damage or, or less um, tarnished plant bug and hopefully less damage into your strawberries. So that's something to think about that that's been done in a lot of different cropping systems, but here's an example for you. Exclusion netting is also an important strategy that has been implemented a lot more in Europe than it is implemented in the US. But there are um, different states where it's more implemented. For example, Minnesota, they do it more than Wisconsin. Hoop houses, high tunnel, rockover, where you could, would see um, on the right-hand side, these are the kind of physical barrier that you put around your crop. And if you do it well, it's just physical. There's no inputs outside of that. And it completely prevents the insects from reaching the crop. So it works really well when it's done well. You can reach 90 plus percent um, reduction in, uh, in infestation and damage. Modifying the harvest schedule. So reducing the impact of the injury. So now we're doing uh, what we can do to uh, reduce, you have impact, how can you reduce that um, in your, on your plant? Um, this is an example, we spotted ring drosophila. So what you can do in some cases is harvest earlier in some cropping systems. 
you just miss the when the insect is um, causing problem. But here in this example I have with spotted wing is harvesting more often. And what you can see here, this is a larva of a, a spotted wing. And here it's going to be when you are harvesting every day in the light bar, every two days in the darker bar, and every three days in the black bar. And you can see the numbers are lower if you harvest every day or every other day compared to every three days. So thinking about that harvest schedule to try to reduce the impact of that injury is going to be important. And then the final one I have for um, cultural control is modifying the host tolerance. So this one, usually that's done genetically through breeding. Um, and that's been done for, again, centuries. Um, and this is what will be called host plant resistance. And it's one that goes back to when you're thinking about planting, check if there are, depending on what you're doing, plants that are resistant to specific problems. In apple, there are plants, uh, uh, cultivars that are resistant to say scab, for example. Um, and in this example here that I have, it's um, variety of cultivars that are uh, resistant to grape phylloxera in grapes. And so that's important to think about that so that you can, from the get-go, have plants that are with this built-in resistance to injury. They can tolerate it without having any issue. And that's the case for grape phylloxera, for example. Um, and, and grapes. Um, it can also be done through good production practices, proper irrigation, fertilization, weed control, all of that, the healthier your plants are going to be, for the most part, the less susceptible they're going to be to damage and to being fed upon. So that's what I had for cultural control. And I'm going to continue here with behavioral control. And so behavioral control is an, a strategy that in, uses what um, Casey mentioned in some cases, but it's um, in this case would be the pheromones that she mentioned. This behavioral control strategy is really looking at chemical control, but those chemicals are not chem pesticides. They are non-lethal chemicals. They don't kill the insects. They are natural chemicals that are either either produced by insects or by plants, or they can even be produced by microbes in some cases. And those chemicals will modify the behavioral response of the receiver. So you could have a female that produces a pheromone and the male, when he smells that, will be attracted to the female. So the female with the pheromone is able to modify the behavior of a male that would be just flying around and suddenly he's closing in to the female to mate with her. So that's the most common ones that we have are the pheromones, but we also have plant chemicals or um, fermentation chemicals. Casey mentioned uh, vinegar, yeast. Those are going to be also attractive to insects. And so these can be used um, in some the sampling and detection that Casey mentioned, but also in strategies called like attract and kill, mass trapping, and mating disruption. So when we're talking about mass trapping and attract and kill, these two are very similar. Um, and what they do is you have an attractant, and so um, you're looking at either a sex pheromone, an aggregation pheromone, or plant chemicals that are very attractive, a very attractive host. And you're bringing them in to either a trap for mass trapping or to um, something that's not trapping them, but that has a killing agent on it. And so they come in, they touch this killing agent, they keep flying, but then they die. And so that would be, uh, for example, on the left-hand side here would be mass trapping. It's a yellow sticky card. The insects come in because they're attracted to it visually or chemically, and then they die in the sticky material. So that's a trap. In this case here, this is an apple. This is just a felt material and it's covered in an insecticide. The insects come in, they're attracted by the, the chemical that's there, the attractant, and then they touch the, the felt that has the insecticide, they fly around and die. That's the difference between mass trapping and attract and kill, is that um, in one, the trap can get overloaded, whereas in the other one, there's no capacity for the trap because there's no trap itself 
and, and they're just in contact with an insecticide. It's important to think about for the mass trapping, if you think about something like say Japanese beetle, where they get so attracted to the trap that the traps get full. So what's important to think about here is that you end up with um, very high densities of traps because you wanna make sure you intercept as many as possible or attract as many as possible um, in, your, in your orchard. This is an example of a tract and kill with Japanese beetle that was research done in my lab. And um, this was using the aggregation pheromone. You have to have a lot of point sources on the, the little round circles here. Um, well, if they're circles, they're round, I guess. Um, and then here you have either the attract and kill in the low gray, the light gray, and then the control that is what the grower would do, which is spray insecticide over the entire uh, vineyard. And we found similar results in both cases. So this is an attract and kill strategy that removes having to spray an entire vineyard and just doing that in a very targeted area. Okay, so now moving on to mating disruption. Um, mating disruption is an important strategy with this behavioral management. And it's really a, a male confusing uh, technique. You're trying to prevent males from finding females and by doing that, you reduce mating, and then you're going to reduce or prevent um, egg laying. And then uh, this is done using sex pheromones. Most sex pheromones are female produced and thus attract males. So when we're monitoring for with sex pheromones, we usually monitor the male population, but the females are the ones that are causing the problem. In this case, it was really thinking about that and thinking, okay, I can't affect the females, but what if I confuse the males? And so what this represents here, this would be a female, this would be the male that's doing what we call a casting behavior into this plume of the pheromone that the female is releasing. So they're casting and every time they get out of the plume, they're like, oh, I gotta turn back in. And slowly they find a female. In mating disruption, you put dispensers in the in the tree, and you don't need to put multiple per tree, but you're gonna to need to put quite a few. And then the males are confused because when they're casting, they're entering the plume of a lure instead of entering the plume of a female. So they're disrupted, they can't find a female, and then um, we get lower damage. There's different ways of dispensing this sex pheromone for mating disruption. Um, the traditional ones would be this tie that you put around the branches, um, and you need a lot of, uh, um, of ties then when you're doing this. It's something like 400 per acre. But there's also puffers that will puff the pheromone, and there's new strategies now in doing uh, granular ones that are uh, dropped with a, either a sprayer or with drones or with helicopters, and there's even some flowable one where you spray that with an a boom sprayer as a liquid, and the pheromone is there. There's a lot of um, research going on to, into this for over the years and continuing. So when do you use mating disruption? In orchards that have 10 or more acres is what's recommended in Apple, but there, there are possibilities in doing it with smaller orchards. So something to keep in mind that it's not necessarily just 10 acres, uh, lower, lower acreage can work as well. Um, it's important to think about where those moths are coming from. Sometimes you have an abandoned orchard next to your orchard, that's not gonna work well. Um, so those kind of considerations is something you're gonna think about as you're thinking about mating disruption. The pest pressure um, is important. It's, it's gonna help you bring the population lower to where you want it to be, to where it is at, where you want it to be but you might need to start by spraying insecticides to bring them down to that, those levels. It's very species, species specific, so it's very targeted and it's environmentally safe. And even though it's chemicals, it's approved in organic production. The cons that are being worked out more and more are really that it's labor intensive if you're hanging dispensers in the trees um, and you need high rates of, uh, of dispensers. So that's gonna be uh, where the labor comes in. Um, but again, there are different strategies that are being implemented as we as we speak to reduce this labor and and think about it in a different in a different way from a labor standpoint. Now I'll pass it on to Casey. 
All right, so we're gonna end here with uh, chemical control. And just to remind you and sort of bring it back, um, when we talk about using chemical control, we really wanna be focusing on these, um, these economic thresholds. Uh, again, the density of the pest at, wi at, at which point we should be making a control, um, a spray, for example. And that keeps it under this line, this economic injury level. That's the line where the pest would start costing you money. Um, and so when it comes to chemical control, we really pay a lot of attention to uh, the, these economic thresholds before we, we start using uh, these control measures. Next slide. And so, you know, we've gone through a variety of things here. There's a lot of things to think about with chemical control in IPM. Um, and we've talked about a lot of them already today. Uh, and making sure that your insecticides are more selective. Um, in organic production, um, a lot of our things are a little more selective, um, but also rotating chemistry to make sure you're preventing um, uh, insecticide resistance. You don't wanna just be using the same product over and over and over again. <clears throat> Next slide. So I just wanted to kind of mention some of these terms. So, you know, when we think about sort of organic chemical control, the background, uh, we, we all of these are considered biopesticides. Um, and they're sort of different, different ones of these. Um, and biopesticides are toxic substances used to kill or control animals, fungi, or plants that cause economic damage to crops. Um, and really there are um, a couple of groups here within organic production, there's really two. There's the biochemical pesticides, which are naturally occurring substances that control pests. Um, you know, mating disruption technically is underneath this blanket, but again, that one's not lethal. We also have things like botanicals and minerals that I'll talk about. Um, and then the other one is microbial pesticides, which are things derived from microorganisms that, um, or either microorganisms or things that are derived from them to control pests. Um, so botanicals being the first one, uh, I want to mention something here. Um, these are very short lived in the environment. So you have to repeatedly apply them and you need very, very thorough coverage for these to work. It's a bunch of different things here. Some of which there's been a fair amount of research on some of which there really hasn't some of these oils, um, you know, we could, uh, we could do some more research on what I've listed here in this, in these uh, boxes are essentially um, tree fruit pests and what we know about these trade names, these products and how they affect these tree fruit pe pests. Um, I just wanna mention where you see a U, that means unknown efficacy. So you see a G, it's good efficacy, where you see an F, it's fair, but where you see a U, it's unknown. So one thing that I want you to take away from this is that there's a lot of products out there in the organic market, and a lot of them, we don't really know how well they work on a lot of the pests um, that they may be controlling. Um, and so it's not that it's not worth trying, it's just that we can't really tell you at this point whether or not some of these things are as effective as we'd like to be able to. Next slide. Uh, minerals are another um, of these groups, and these are just minimally processed, well, exactly what they sound like, minerals um, uh, that you just, that we actually take out of the earth. Um, and some of the products here that are very common, uh, kale and clay or surround, very good for suppression of things, but it isn't, it doesn't really control things. Uh, sulfur sprays, and then the insecticidal soaps, I just want to mention, are used quite often in greenhouse production, and they work quite well there. Um, and again, there's a lot of unknowns here, here uh, as well, as far as how um, effective that they are. Next slide. Um, and then uh, the microbial pesticides. So these are formulated microorganisms or their byproducts. So they're not necessarily live. And these products tend to be very, very selective. So you have very little non-target concern when you're using these um, often. Um, and these are somewhat complicated. I wanna mention that you always have to be careful with these because sometimes they're not approved for organic production because they might have some ingredients that aren't organic or some procedures when they're being made that aren't organic. So make sure you're paying attention to your insecticide labels before you start using stuff. Um, always pay attention to your insecticide labels. That's the, the law and the first thing you wanna look at. Um, but uh, these products are also further complicated, sort of the same way as when I talked about biological control, because they will have specialized storage and application procedures. Again, some of these are live microbes, and so they have a limited shelf life, and 
they don't necessarily work very well in open field conditions. Um, they're, they're definitely quite effective, again, in these uh, protected culture, things like greenhouses and high tunnels. Um, next slide. Um, and I just want to go through a few of these. Uh, and I just wanted to say that with the first one, the, um, uh, the BT products, things like Dipel, these work very well in protected culture for caterpillars. We use them a lot in high tunnels, um, and they really, really take care of the problem. Um, there's some products here, another bacterial product, Grandivo, that's really good on spotted wing Drosophila. And then I want to mention the Spinosad in Trust here, um, which is a product that, as you can see, I've got G's next to several things and G through E, which means good to excellent efficacy. So this is a really good product. It's quite expensive, um, but it's a, it's a quite good um, organic product with pretty broad spectrum control. Um, and then there is some fungal products out there as well um, that I just wanted to mention here. Um, and that about wraps it up there. Yeah, I guess we forgot to put our contact information in the last slide, but you can feel free to contact us if you need anything. Maybe we can put that into the chat then. Um, Josie, if you want to put their contact information into the chat, that would be great. Thank you both for those presentations. Um, it was super wonderful and great to learn about. Before we start our question and answer session today, we've got a, a small survey for you all to take. And again, this just kind of helps us get an idea of what what works well and what you'd be interested in for the future. So thanks for taking that survey. And we'll just wait a, a few minutes for it to get filled out. Wait just a little bit here, a few more polls rolling in. We probably should get going, Melanie, okay. because it's one o'clock already. Okay, sounds good. All right, well, we'll, we'll end the poll there. And then um, we have a few questions in the chat. Let me scroll up. So Suzanne says that she's struggling to identify what's causing hard spots on her Asian pears. She has four varieties and over 60 trees and something seems to be causing a small scab and toughness underneath it. She's not sure if it's an insect or a disease. Oh, that's a good question. Casey, I don't know if you work with pears, but I don't work with pears. So I don't know specifically, but it sounds like likely an insect that would be doing that, that would be probing, and then it becomes kind of like, um, maybe if it's more corky, that's more of an insect, maybe it's really tough, that might be potentially a pathogen, but I would recommend to uh, look online. We have a publication in Wisconsin called Growing, I don't know if it just pairs, but if you type in Growing Pears in Wisconsin, you should be able to find it. And it will have kind of what are the common insects in pears. Unfortunately, because there's no commercial pear production in the in the upper Midwest, we don't know those insects. We don't work with them so much. So it's harder for us to answer questions on, say, you know, pears or apricots or peach that are, are not going to be very successful up here. Would San Jose scale be something that could be on the bark? It, it sounds a little um, like San Jose scale, and I know at least here in Illinois, we are having more trouble with San Jose scale recently. Um, it was something that I think growers weren't dealing with as much, and all of a sudden it's kind of back with a vengeance. Um, and so uh, that, it sounds a little like that to me, um, but I don't, I wouldn't know without being able to, yeah, see uh, what it, what it was. And then this is a little bit more general, but um, what about, Robert's asking, what about using ozonated water or hydrogen peroxide as a method of control for insect pests? 
as far as I know, I hear a lot about that. I think there's been a lot of marketing for this, um, but I haven't seen, I don't think, any research on that. Yeah. I think that it it has been um, maybe more successful with um, pathogens. Mm -hmm. um, there's been more research on that, but on an insect standpoint, I haven't seen anything. And if I heard anything, it was not successful. So I wouldn't put too much weight in it. If you wanted to try it, by all means, try it. But I think that it's harder to uh, to see the effect it would have on insects that are within the fruit for the most part is those that we're looking at. Um, I don't think that there's really, that there's data to say that it works well or not. Yep, I would second that. Thank you. And Dennis asks, on my apple trees, when two apples are side by side where they touch, some small insect regularly makes small holes. Why? No other injury on open apple area. Oof. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't either. Yeah, I can't think of anything. Uh -uh. No, maybe. So if you don't get damage on anything else, I was going to say, like if they touch, they go from one to the other. But if there's none, if they're not touching, I don't know what that would be. Hopefully, you don't have too many that touch. And then I would sacrifice one so you have the other one that doesn't have anything. Right? Yeah. And, and then... One apple. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, and then Dennis says, um, or asks, what about adding Dipel to kaolin clay mix um, for a spray? I'm not very mm -hmm. familiar with Dipel. Well, any kind of mixes like that, it's impossible for us to really have an answer for yeah. because there's so many products that the combination of two is exponential on how many that can be. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a direct answer because none of us have tested that. Um, I don't know what it would do. Um, I don't, what, so let me back up. First of all, we don't know. We don't <laughs> have an answer because we can't test every single combination. The second one is if you want to do something like that, there are webinars, we have some on our website, I'm sure. And Madeline, if you want to share where this one will be posted, that would be great. Mm -hmm. um, but what you want to do is the jar test. You're going to mix two pesticides, whether it's an insecticide, a fungicide, two insecticides, you do a jar test. You put the two of them together and you shake. And we have a webinar from a grape from I don't know how long ago that is about all about tank, tank mixing because they might not be compatible. So that's the first thing you would do. And then the second one you would do is spray a small area and make sure that there's no phytotoxicity that would happen from the mixture. So those are my cautious you know, comments to make here before you do any kind of combination. After that, yeah, we don't know what the efficacy is going to be. Hopefully, it will be good, but it's hard to tell what it's going to do. All right, thank you. Um, and then there's just one comment that on the on the pairs, Dennis says that it's like having a small stone inside. And I just thought to mention that pears do have sclerid cells in them, so they tend to kind of have those more granular um, textures on the inside. And sometimes you can get sort of a lump, but I might be mistaking exactly what it was. Without having samples in front of us, it can be kind of difficult to diagnose sometimes. But those are some great questions. And I think we're at a, a time where we can wrap up this webinar and thank our speakers for being here. Um, and Lauren's just mentioning that if you have some photos, you can ask, you can submit them to the Ask Your Gardening. Um, I missed it here. Check out Lauren's comment. Um, yeah, there's the Ask the Gardening line. So just keep that in mind, everybody. And thanks for coming to our webinar today. We'll look forward to seeing you next time. Our next uh, webinar will be organic disease management. And then we'll be finishing up the season with marketing for organic fruit. So look forward and stay tuned.